Hey, everybody, welcome. It's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on. We've got a great two hours lined up for you. We're going to kick it off here in a minute talking about one of my favorite, favorite topics, sacred geometry. Um, didn't know exactly what it was, but I'm going to share a little bit during the show about how I grew up and what I did as a very young child. This is, of course, today with Richard Heath joining me here today. Sacred Geometry is his book the latest book, Language of the Angels. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, of course, we've got three books to give away, but I need to just pause for a moment and back off my mic a little bit right there. And Benny, another great, has gone to be with the angels. This is very true. It's very true. Mary Wilson of the uh, Supremes. For those of you out there, everybody thinks Diana Ross, she's still here, uh, Diana Ross and the Supremes, but Mary Wilson um, and Florence were friends in high school and they started a group before it was called the Supremes. And Mary was an activist. She was beyond being one of the original members of the Supremes. Um, took life to a new level. She was there for people, stood up for people. And in, in the strangest sense, when she left the Supremes, she was one of the people many people knew about. Usually if you're part of a group and you have somebody in the front and you go away, rarely do we know about that loss. But today, another music great is now with the angels, or at least I think she is. Um, and for those of you out there, there is the history on this. And, and the reason that this is so interesting for me is my first undergraduate paper, believe it or not, my first undergraduate paper at the College of St. Elizabeth's, a night school, I had to write a paper that had to do with music. Everybody else wrote about Bach or they <laughs> wrote about Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky or they wrote about Joe, they wrote about, I wrote about Motown, a 25 page paper on Motown. But here's what I know. We can stop for a moment and honor those that have passed. And we remember the impact they had on us growing up. But what is it about remembering all of that? And I think Benny's gonna play some clips as we go in and out of break, so we're gonna get a reminder. But what is it about those things that touch our hearts? Whether you're remembering, whether you're remembering Mary Wilson or you're remembering uh, Chadwick Boseman or you're remembering somebody deep in your life, you know, what is it that hits us at an angelic level? And what is it about the angelic mind that is in a deep understanding of patterns. Now, one of the things I want to say, and why did I bring up, why did I bring up this story? I had to pick one song and study the patterns of the song. I literally had to draw out the patterns of the song as part of the paper. So somebody who was teaching this class must have known something about what Richard has really brought to the surface. Why would you write and draw patterns associated with a song? But here we are today, and we're understanding more and more about sacred geometry, how we put it in our space, how we put it in our, in our lives. But how do we decode the angelic science hidden in a wide range of monuments and sites and things we build, websites that have sacred geometry all through it? How do we decode it? And what is it that is so deeply enriched in the messages? That's what my guest is here to talk about today. Somebody who studies these achievements in the ancient world. And today in his fabulous book, it is really incredible. It is a work of art itself. Sacred Geometry, Language of the Angels. Richard, it's great to have you here. Thank you, Pat. I think, and let me start out with this. I think as kids, and this is just my take on it, I think as kids, 
we have somewhere inside of us the knowing. Now, why do I say that? If you're me, you have pretty much been sent into the corner, have been sent to the principal, even been put in front of Mother Superior because you are doodling symbols and images that don't make sense to anyone. What have you discovered? Do we have it in us? Did we forget about it? Or is this something that we need to really investigate at a much deeper level? Well, one of the things uh, that has happened to us is that we have lost uh, our roots to a degree because we uh, haven't understood, uh, I believe, a civilization or a culture rather that um, first faced the problem of uh, where are we um, and what kind of a world are we in? And the, the uh, truth for them was simply what they could do with that. Whereas when we're doodling and everything else, we are making up a, uh, well, when we remember, I think that's the most important thing. The things we remember are crucially important to us and they create our sense of selfhood. And there's many things that we don't remember actually. And so significant memories are created uh, and produce consciousness, which has a memory, perfect memory often. So I believe that the people, uh, uh, in the megalithic period who are responsible for building these uh, wonderful large apparently rude monuments because they're not carved or anything they did the best they could with the monuments they had to start uh, investigating what kind of a world they lived in and the world of the sky was particularly interesting to them uh, it's full of patterns of course we've 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 patterned it uh, uh, we don't know who who made, for instance, our constellations, but uh, it, they were probably derived from somewhere in the Mediterranean by a navigational civilization. And uh, they, these Greek stories and many other stories appear to have come from a time just before history started in terms of writing and recording what's uh, happening. So that period before 3000 BC, uh, how, how would they have possibly understood uh, how, how the world was organized? Uh, and they did, they, they did this just by seeing the sun on the horizon and the moon on the horizon setting or, 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 or uh, rising. And uh, there are time periods. And so the, these time periods have been seen on rock art and, and uh, bones uh, where they've had rough uh, counting of days. And uh, the moon repeats in, in 49 days. So what I'm saying is that the, that the patterns uh, are, are emerge uh, out of uh, numerical astronomical facts. And uh, they are starting to use geometry to the horizon. They're counting between things that happen at a particular angle. Uh, and from that, they are having numbers like we have numbers today, only their numbers are lengths. Uh, and if I just go back to the musical yeah. idea, yeah. the musical idea, the, the, the lengths are like lengths of a string, a musical string. Yeah. And so they found ratios between uh, the, the moon and the planets, the uh, giant planets in the solar system. Uh, and these would have uh, introduced them to music itself. Um, I, I believe that it, it, the music was not just invented by making instruments, although mm -hmm. people played instruments with each other, no doubt, but that the, uh, the deeper meaning of, of music is that its ratios can be heard um, to be in some way different to other sounds. And, and out of them comes a whole world of musical meaning and uh, so the, the story of the book um, I say is, is a story really about how numeracy uh, created the kind of, of set of subjects that you find with Pythagoras and also that the numbers that you find in sacred literature ever since that 3000 BC watershed. Yeah what I love about well, first of all, the book to me is so mind opening 
I mean, there are certain parts of this that I read and I thought, wow, was, was I doing that? Well, I didn't know I was doing that. No. Um, I'm a, they call me a doodler. Uh, I have <laughs> art that I create from doodling. And mm. it's, I have a piece of art, a sketch. It's the bizarrest looking thing. I have no idea what it means. And it's perfectly symmetrical. What's on the left, mm. every part of what's on the left is on the right. Now, I didn't yeah. sit there and say, mm. I'm going to put what's on the left, I'm going to put it on the right. But what I love about that assignment in that undergraduate class, this teacher had to know something. I didn't know what to ask her then, but if she was sitting here with us now, I would have a lot of questions for her because she wasn't as interested in what people were writing about because yeah. she never discussed our papers. She discussed our imagery. And I've often wondered about that. And as I'm reading your book, I can remember, you know, bits and pieces of what I put on paper, but I don't remember it at all. Is this for us, is this now a level of communication, which we have yet to fully recognize, but more importantly, use to its fullest? Yes, I, I, I'm sure somehow that that will come to pass mm -hmm. because we we and uh, we are we have we've found all sorts of uh, we've become somewhat trapped in our uh, cycles of uh, 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 of material expansion and uh, you know all these imperialism uh, our history has been mm -hmm. like that and. Uh, what we see now is not only individualism uh, being people need to be able to do something for themselves, but uh, in, in new areas. I mean, a lot of people are being forced back onto their back, back foot, aren't they, at the moment, uh, by the uh, difficulties of the situation. Uh, and yet there's a growth of an accelerating growth of all sorts of activities, such as coaching and things that were, you know, there seems to be uh, everybody wants to become more than they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and when the people emerge from the Stone Age, can you imagine after you know thousands of years of ice and other things that they, they and the, 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 every day of their life, you know, they're going out and and being intelligent uh, in the environment uh, to support themselves. Um, when they set their minds to, uh, and these were special minds as well. But we see from their art. The, the, the ideas like symmetry and also being able to see right the way around a stone and do a painting uh, that is only revealed to us when it's unwound artificially mm -hmm. with photographs. So these, these sort of people had a sense of symmetry. I remember uh, about four or five years ago, I was working with a musicologist in America called Ernest McLean. And one of the strongest things that came across, because I never actually met him, was this uh, this sense of symmetry as being a spiritual faculty. And so when you drew the, the symmetrical picture, yeah. Yeah. you were, uh, you, you, uh, you know, it was active in you, that faculty. Yeah. And it's one of the uh, lesser known areas of uh, study with like the numbers, the sacred geometry, and, and it's part of the, of these uh, sacred arts. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that I want to talk to too is, as I was reading your book, I was, I, if you are watching me, I'm reading your book and clearly I am, I am really trying to understand the mathematics, mathematics and the numbers in it. But more than that, what I'm doing is if you're watching me, I'm just going like this. Uh, my head is like up and down, like, oh, yeah, yeah, my, I'm going like this. Like I turn the page and I'm like, yeah, that's true. Mm. You know, do we really think our existence into being is without some higher intelligence? Do we really mm. believe that we did this all by ourselves? Do we really believe that dot, 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 dot? And my head is going up and down, up and down. And mm. yet you brought this conversation, Richard, to a whole new level because this idea of metrologic, these foot ratios, the idea uh, when you put this ancient 
aspect of how things came to being. And that's just me. I'm like a lay person. So when I look at a monolith, you know, I don't care what the wonders of the world are. When I look at something like that, I don't say, oh my gosh, what a genius. How did they create that perfect symmetry? I think, oh my gosh, hmm. how did they create it? You know, meaning how as human beings, could they have created it? And, you know, more time goes on, we're now with communication and social media and access to videos, right? You know, mm -hmm. 30 years ago, people weren't seeing these things. No. But now people are. And I want to ask you, what is the message we want to, to share today, given what you have in your book about the ratios of the angelic mind or the angelic mind period, to say to people, no, you're not crazy. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's not so up to them to say that we're crazy anyway. Yeah, I know. <laughs> The, the other aspect is our, um, I think it's very important to recognize that a lot of things have gone a bit, a bit wrong mm -hmm. because the, in, we, we live on a planet and we see everything from that planet. But when we got into this um, heavy period of abstraction in order to develop the sciences and finally the religious people stopped fighting it, um, some things went wrong uh, for us because uh, uh, there was a lot of value attached to being on the planet itself rather than being involved in so many abstractions and ways of doing things that, that weren't, aren't direct. So we, we have in the sky uh, things that have been recorded for us and the angels that I speak of in the book I am really talking about uh, higher intelligences, mm -hmm. yep, and yep. that the, they um, they created the Earth uh, in terms of adapting it, because from a solar system into a second creation, which was this special place where the Moon was in harmony with the uh, outer planets. That was that seems to have happened exactly at the period that we now live in. So that from the date that Homo sapiens sapiens started to uh, to be a species, uh, there's been a story in which um, uh, the planets were harmonious. So we have to ask, well, why would it be that that angels mm -hmm. would wish to do that? And I believe that this may be something like the the method whereby a, not only a living planet is created, but uh, a a planet that can uh, have thinking beings who have contact with some spiritual experience so mm -hmm. my idea uh, with the angels was to break uh, the rationalistic approach and to recognize that this information that's not all mine of course uh, that it, it it is it its significance for the human race is that we are um that we're in a special created space uh in which we can be uh spiritual as a potential mm -hmm. yeah. uh, no one can make us uh spiritual uh because we are going to become responsible for our own will yeah you know Look, uh, I want to, uh, first of all, this is to me, the book that you've written is based on other books you've written, years of research. Yes. You know, when I read this book once through, and then of course I went back to it to prepare, like what exactly do I want to yeah. talk about today? Yeah. When I looked at the work in this, but yet this is now me. When I looked at some of the drawings in the book, and then of course, you know, how you laid out the geometry in it, I said, again, my head's up and down and I'm saying, oh yeah, that makes total sense. But of course you have done years and years and years and years of work on it. I wanna ask you this question because you've been researching this, you've been documenting it, you've been writing about it. 
you know, we're watching television shows on ancient mysteries of the world. And people yeah. are like me. They're up and down with their head. They're going, yeah. And yet we don't have a clue about the depth of knowledge that you have, but yet we're agreeing with you. What do you think is happening there, Richard? Well, I, like, I, I think where it points is most important. Uh, I, I have tried to be disciplined in not having, uh, not trying to say sensational things uh, about the ancient world, because actually that just irritates all the scientists and the, uh, <laughs> you know. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and, and actually the trouble is that in each of those areas, there's not that much data. So I wanted to bring it back and bring Atlantis forward, so to speak, yep. and have and have something where there's this boots on the ground that you can see. You know, there's things actually happening there with these people. Uh, I live in an area in which megalithic monuments are quite significant, uh, and uh, uh, now, uh, but so you can make this a dusty, dry subject if you want, or you can sensationalize it. But I think that we've got to have both factors in there because the key factor is to realize that where we live is a special place. And uh, the way our society is functioning for us at the moment, we don't think it's a special place. Right. And yet, as I go through the book and as I, I, I really follow along, I am really struck by three things. And I want to talk with you about them when we come back. Um, what have we learned in time that we are now trying to reflect in the heightened level of technology, the heightened level of visuals, the heightened level of trying to blend ancient sacred geometry with our pop culture? What is it that is driving us to bring these imagery, to bring these things forward, even in the strangest, let's just say Hollywood way. Is it the chicken or the egg? You know, why would somebody come up with blockbuster movie about things that none of us really know are true, but have sacred geometry through them? When we come back, we're gonna take a look at time and space. Mm -hmm. Does it really exist? Or is it like some of us believe that it is the key to the evolution of consciousness? Let's take a short break. When we come back more with Richard, how do we get a copy of the book, Richard, before we pop off? And how do we find out more about you? Well, there's plenty uh, around uh, yeah. in America, <laughs> but we've been delayed by Brexit in bringing them yeah. into this country. But yeah. um, the other thing is that I, I run a, uh, a quite a large website that people can use uh, to find things on most uh, other kind of subjects that I've written on. So that's called sacred.numbersciences, plural, dot org. So sacred.numbersciences.org and it's a website as well as a blog and and other things and in fact you know obviously it has this this meeting today on it as well now so uh please do uh browse there because it's a uh, it's not pay to view <laughs> it hasn't got ads uh, and you can just uh, browse it to your heart's content if you wish when we come back uh not only are we going to give away three copies of the book benny but one of my favorite things to learn about, and, and, and I really mean learn about, are the temples of earth and the messaging inherent in here. And until you look at the book and the way Richard really outlines things, I mean, honestly, my head was going up and down, up and down. Even if you don't understand, quote, the math, the math or the equation, you will see how beautifully the messaging comes to light. Let's take a short message. When we come back, do you have a favorite temple? Is there some place you're drawn to? Maybe it isn't gigantic. Maybe it isn't one of the wonders of the world, but maybe it's something you came across in awe and ask yourself the question, how did that get there? 
Let's take a short break. We'll be right back with my very special guest, the author of this fantastic book, Richard Heath, new book, Sacred Geometry, Language of the Angels. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you, Benny, for that. And by the way, I just got a question that came in and let me answer it. It has nothing to do with my very special guest book, but it might have something. The song that I wrote about in that undergraduate paper, thank you for asking. I had to listen to it close to 200 times to do this diagram. Was I here a symphony? So if you want to try to do a diagram out of that song, it was very different Supreme song. It was a very different song. Uh, but today it's all about sacred geometry. What is that? Do you know that you're even inspired by it in your everyday life? Do you know exactly what we're talking about? And I love, Richard, first of all, that you talk about angels. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But before we do, Benny, three copies to give away. This book, I seriously, this is the kind of book that I like to get instead of watching television. And I like to look at this and then say, let me Google that picture. Let me see what Richard's talking about. It is fantastic. It explains at a really fascinating level what the intrigue is. Why are we intrigued by certain structures? Why do they mean something to us? And mm -hmm. what the heck was anybody thinking creating the, the monument in Washington? What was that about? I mean, who came up with that idea to create that? Uh, 1-800-930-2819. Seriously, Richard, I don't know if you know the, the, what, the monument, Washington Monument? Yeah. Who came up with that idea? I mean, you look at that and you say there's nothing in the United States like that. Why would we build that? Um, well, it, uh, I do a bit of, uh, have you seen the bit in, uh, in my second book about it? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, I thought it might be. Uh, yeah. But worth asking as well, because uh, it's, uh, well, it, of course, everyone thinks it's to do with the Freemasons. Right. Uh, but, in, you know, and that, that, that this particular book was about the secret men from the north and uh, the everything from the, uh, the, uh, uh, the people, who, you know, 1066 onwards. And uh, the Gothic revival, you know, when Gothic, uh, cathedrals uh, suddenly appeared, uh, you know, and there's this crusade to Jerusalem. So all, all things are happening, uh, these religious orders, and and there seems to be secret people who know all about this geometry, the master masons and stuff. So uh, out of that, uh, this is an early example of which of what this this latest book is sort of like come back to in yeah. a way. Uh, that, that there were uh, a, a European-wide movement for building cathedrals in any new way. But in the present book, I show how, how you can see the link between the, the, the early Greek temples and, and the Gothic. And I believe that one of the meanings of the word Gothic was Greek for the mm -hmm. people at that time. So, um, and of course, uh, America has a fascinating relationship with things Greek, uh, Greek architecture, um, the fraternity yes. system, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a sort of secret behind that as well. And I remember I was studying uh, latitudes, and I found that uh, Washington D.C. was on the same latitude as uh, Del uh, Delphi. You know, the the mm -hmm. amazing oracle in Greece, mm -hmm. uh, implying that that could have been one of the choices, you know, for for making it in this rather unsuitable place. You know, it, it was it's a difficult place, Washington, uh, yep. and it was always too big as well, and they yeah. could hardly fill it up for a century. Uh, so it's a great story all in uh, as to why that happened. But one wonders sometimes whether there are groups that are in at the beginning uh, to shape history, and that these these sort of numerical things are part of their expertise as well. So that uh, in the in the present book. Uh, I show how the, a very simple geometry to do with pi, but very sophisticated, uh, has early roots, and yet it goes right through the built heritage of humanity. Uh, and these are circular monuments, as were built, uh, you know, in in Rome, uh, in the uh, Pantheon, and um, in 
the lovely uh, Hagia Sophia in uh, what's now Turkey, but it was the uh, oh yeah, the, amazing the church. So yeah, all of the and the same template is being used throughout. So uh, the the key thing about this is there was a guy called John Michel in in Britain who arrived in the late sixties and and he made an enormous contribution towards the Earth mysteries, and these are these sorts of mysteries. Uh, you know, the numbers, the measures, uh, why certain things were built, you know, alignments, all this. And uh, um, as part of this, he, uh, he really put forward this design, but there are some designs in here that I, uh, he, never, he never owned up to knowing of them anyway, such as Westminster, the pavement at Westminster Abbey in, in, in Britain, which is an ancient monument. Uh, you know, it's the 12th century, or I think it's 13th, and it's got uh, the same thing of these circles and squares, uh, and seems to be an exposition of a modern tradition almost at that time, mm -hmm. uh, still using it. And so the question that arises for us is, uh, what are they building? And the subject is, is sacred space, uh, with the Greek word is temenos, mm -hmm. and a sacred space could be a field even, because fields were donated for to be sacred spaces, and then they elongated the uh, the small uh, square buildings that they lived in. They, they would elongate, elongate them, and then eventually they'd go on a plinth and they'd have the portico. Uh, and uh, there's examples in, in this one of a major one dedicated to uh, the wife of Zeus, Hera, on mm -hmm. Samos. And that's where Pythagoras came from. So the tradition seems to be flowing. And Pythagoras was named after Delphi. So the, these tr um, these these threads uh, are uh, worth uh, discovering because they give us a clue as to what's being created. And the the ultimate really space is a a, a, a scale model of the Earth itself as a circle which is the mean earth, the, mean, the earth as if it didn't spin. And the, uh, the moon has a relationship of three to, the, to 11 in diameter or yes. so the circumference. I read so that. The, yes. Now, this is a, a, a key example because the, the moon has a mysterious history as to how it was created billions of years ago with, by a collision in the early solar system and it did various things. There's an appendix in there about what the moon has done for us, apart from also uh, being harmonious eventually with the giant planets when we're in our age now. Yeah. And so this implies, again, you see that, the, that there are some sort of secret people who know stuff that are doing things, but they don't seem to uh, draw attention to themselves, particularly. They're trying to enable us perhaps to get into better positions uh, but to build sacred spaces. And so that's the notion of, of a church or a mosque or of a synagogue. Uh, you know, the, the, and often the oldest ones, they can have keys into the size of the earth by being a scale model of it. I, I was so fascinated. You know, I've read several of your books, that, hence the Washington Monument reference. But I'm also really... I'm one of the, I'm, I have an interesting background, you know, I'm a kid from the Bronx, so I have this street smart approach to things right. Mm -hmm. uh, street smart spirituality so when I read your books and I think of it so my mind Richard goes to dang step back all the pictures we've been seeing of the Capitol, right? This was my latest discovery. And I don't, I'm not gonna take up a lot of time in this show because we got, I wanna talk about sacred numbers. But my latest after going through this book, they flashed a picture on TV and it was like three seconds. And it was the monument, the Capitol and the Pentagon. Mm. And I was like, what? So the Capitol is like in your book, 100 Byzantine feet. Now, I don't know this, but in your book, you I, I mean, honestly, I'm reading your book and this pops up on the TV and I'm like, holy cow, it looks like this picture in, in Richard's book. Mm. I mean, are we just like creating these things and not know? Now, I don't know the dimensions of the Capitol. I mean, I don't know. But clearly this uh, Hagia Sophia, the dome, and the way you reference it, I was literally going through the book and I popped up for a minute and there was the monument, capital, 
and the Pentagon? Who builds a building that looks like the Pentagon? Who in yeah. their mind? Yeah. I mean, I mean, have you has anybody ever thought who in their right mind builds a building to look like that? I want to get to this because I think underneath this, everyone relates to numbers. Yeah. Almost everyone I know. I know that if you give me a number other than 11, it's my birthday number. It was my jersey playing softball. It is everywhere. We didn't celebrate our 10th year anniversary, Richard, because I wanted to celebrate our 11th this year. Have no idea. But let's talk about sacred geometry. Let's talk about sacred numbers and sacred geometry, because we are operating intuitively without your knowledge. And yet, there's something about it that people get so attached to when it comes to numbers. <laughs> well, we can also take your your theme of music and the Supremes. Yes. Because, because uh, uh, Pythagoras is famous for having established that the, uh, the intellectual uh, number ratios uh, of music are those that are most pleasant when they're low numbers. And mm. so... You know, it's, it shows examples of this in the book where the first six numbers allow all the, all the major ratios in the scale, uh, you know, the thirds, and the fifths, and fourths, and uh, octaves. And, the, and these, are, uh, these are known then by our intellect. But what you're suggesting is that be, because we can uh, hear them in our it just hear them and not know anything we don't i mean I, I listened to all of the music you know when i was young yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh and I, I never studied melody or any of this thing but i could sing them today and so um you know like the beatles and so forth and uh, of course supremes so i uh, I, I was functioning fully functioning without understanding the numerical nature of music so that is an example and symmetry is another one you've mentioned tonight uh, that we have these inbuilt capacities and you can describe these intellectually but you can also with the mind and you can describe them you can experience them directly and so that for some reason makes them special to us i got asked a question yeah. richard and this i want you to jump in here okay I got asked a question once. I can't remember if it was Olivia Newton-John that asked me the question or somebody asked me the question. I think it was her in an interview. And of course I said, well, of course my favorite album is your album, the one we're talking about now. But my second favorite album is Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. And mm. she said to me, what was it about that? I said, before I heard the music, it was the album cover. Yeah. And she looked at it and she said, yes, I was drawn to the album cover. I said, it's sacred geometry. She said, yeah. There's and, some fan fantastic uh, things right? on television about this uh, yeah. particular album cover as well. Yep. Sorry. But go ahead, because yeah. inherent in there, when I looked at it closer and I watched the special on TV, I, I mean, I watched it. I had to, I was it. thinking to myself, what is my fascination with this one album with that cover? and with the music that is so haunting. And as you listen, or as you look at it, you can see numbers pop off the page sometimes when you look at that. And I wanna ask you about that. If, are we here now? And clearly your book, I think is an invitation. Are we here now to really step in and explore more than just an intuition? about sacred geometry and sacred numbers, but to literally learn the messages and then learn to use them. I, I think uh, that uh, we could recover uh, this, uh, some aspects of the state of mind that we lost in order to become civilized. Mm. And, uh, uh, to a certain extent, I've gone through a little bit of that myself by mm -hmm. by getting rid of things uh, and looking at it in a way which is possible to the people that were doing these megalithic monuments. And every time I've got better at doing that, I've got better at seeing more of what they've done. And so I think we will become aware of what was a formerly invisible world 
that belongs in in a, in a world called uh, eternity. Of course, we have an idea about this world called eternity, but we don't see very much into it because we're dominated by the functional world of the everyday. And then there are these these things in the ninth chapter. I I talk about John Bennett, who's a, a philosopher and a student of Gurdjieff, and he. Mm. Uh, sort of he played the uh to uh the things that, that Gurdjieff had uh, told him uh, and created a what I call a normal kind of world philosophy cosmology from it and it's very useful because it, it tells us that that we really need to develop new faculties rather than chase after things uh these faculties that allow us to see more and may end up that we are happier mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and that we can see our way forward to whatever it is we want to do through doing that. So it, it's that that's I don't I'm I don't I feel that we obviously could be very wishful thinking about it, but it's <laughs> it's, it's very good to see now that in a way uh, religion told us what we could do, and now science is telling us what we can do, but really. Uh, we need to get on better with ourselves and with others. Uh, uh, and, and Bennett had an idea that the new age that's beginning will be a synergic age where people will cooperate with each other. And in, in that's the case, then uh, technology could be uh, the best of both worlds, providing it's not trying to mind mm -hmm. uh, mind wash people mm -hmm. get them to buy products all the time uh, or 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 extract wealth yeah and so i think we, we are, we're working on some sort of mediation to try and negotiate a settlement where uh where uh human beings can be allowed to mm -hmm. uh to be more free uh, from functional concerns and and be able to pursue their individual and group uh way of working yeah and i have to tell you i loved as i read through the book i loved the the presentation of what you called you know the harmony of of the harmony of the local cosmos and then you went on to talk about the pavements of the savior and then you went on to talk about uh cosmology and numerology and then I got to the section on emergence. And I and if you don't mind, I want to ask you about this. I this this was the thing I I, I put a little post-it on here to ask you about. Because for those of you listening, you have to really look at the book and read the book to really get the essence when we're talking about, you know, the cosmic individuality. And the reason that this struck with me, I used to deliver mail to a man named Arno Penzias. He Art Penzias and Wilson, Bell yes. Labs, Big Bang, had bagels with Arno every Friday. Ah. Every Friday. I, I got to ask him some of what I now realize was the most ridiculous questions that you could ask, and he engaged me. And one of the things he said led, led me to this statement in your book. And I asked him about this. I asked him a question. Um, about the cosmos, about Big Bang, and about chaos, but why do they, I would say things like Mr. Penzias, or Dr. Penzias, or Mr. or Arno, <laughs> that's what we called him. Uh, we called him Bagel Man. Uh, and I would ask him, why, if things are so chaotic, do they seem so organized when I look to this guy? And he said something similar to what you say in Emergence, and I'd like to read it. He didn't say it this clearly. The doctrine of the microcosm vis-a-vis -vis the macrocosm after Pythagoras reveal the human being as a being like a sacred building already reflecting the cosmos while also reflecting God in the sense of a complete of completing the universe. Boy, did I have to read that a hundred times. That is one of the most powerful statements that I have read in a long time. And it is jam packed. And it's in the section on emerges, emergence. Can you talk to this section in the book? 
because I found this section different than the others, but seriously powerful. Is it this? This is at the end of the book. Yeah, it's at the end in emergence. It's two thirty-five. Two thirty-five. I have to get my glasses on now. Yeah, I mean, I read this over and over again, and it reminded me of some of the questions I asked on her oh, Penzias. Oh yes, emergence. Yep, and I got to tell you about Mr. Penzias, Dr. Penzias. No matter okay. what ridiculous question over my bagel with cream cheese and schmear, wow, he yes. answered it. And I mm. just read this and I thought, mm. wow, sacred buildings in the human body were modeled on sacred universe through the connection power of numbers. Well, that makes sense for people going to them uh, because then uh, there's, a, you know, there's an alignment between the human and the spiritual mm -hmm. in, in the building. So that, that was a, uh, it's a kind of explanation of it. I mean, I'm really fascinated to do more work on the microcosm myself. I, I hope you do it because <laughs> the answer that I was looking for, I kept going through the books and I'm gonna, I was like, okay, when are you going to tell me why I'm fascinated with the number 11? But then I realized it's not a book about numerology per se. It really is the discovery of this and what we can find inherent. And, and you know, this idea of a reflection really explains to me why we are so fascinated right now in the world, in our pop culture and heroes, why if you look at the box office receipts, pre-COVID, during COVID, people are not necessarily interested in anything that doesn't have wings, doesn't fly, can't lift a building. The numbers are just so seriously talking about them and then people are talking about them are mm. we seeing micro and macro in the fascination with what we call fantasy which may not be fantasy at all mm. um i think powers of imagination uh, obviously uh change the world um i think though that um that when you make efforts and uh, you can continue on trying to discover, your, your imagination becomes uh, finely tuned. Uh, one example of that was I was working on, on Karnak and these special grooved stones that they have there that were locked away around 3000 BC. And <laughs> I knew I couldn't, I couldn't afford to go from Scotland to, to Karnak uh, because I just didn't have the money. And so I kept on working with what I could do and what I'd had got. And because of that uh, apparent difficulty, you know, I, pro I probably did better because what happened was I, I, my, my brain started to be able to see the patterns that had been created by the people uh, uh, who built them. And I believe that these, these um, they're all in this one chambered, uh, chambered passageway can and it and it has every stone almost is decorated, but it has signs of weathering on it. So it was taken there when they decided to build this monument, and then it was filled with sand to finish to finish the work. And the uh, I believe that I can see actual monuments that are there in Karnak, incarnated, so to speak, on the stone. So it was like an information board. If you in this country we go to a place and they have an information board. To tell you about it uh, and i think that these were like mm. information boards and also the monuments themselves became used by people who studied so what i'm saying is this power of imagination we we can develop the power that we need um uh, that was a demonstration of it to me because i've heard this statement of rumi who said that's a mystic from uh, the yeah. arab world and he he said if you want capacities um then you, you you need to increase your necessity so i would say that's a, such a wonderfully general thing to say that yeah, if it is something you want uh you've got to make it necessary for you to have it yeah yeah 
I, I love that quote, by the way. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, it is the one that really I think about. I, I, I think about a couple of quotes quite often, but that's the one that's always been a lot of mind boggling because, you know, in our society, you know, we poo poo the desire, the need, you know, we look at need as something negative and necessity as something that is not for um, the worthy, so to speak. And yet it is really Rumi's uh, statement on that is beautiful. Richard, I want to thank you for today. I, I know I had a lot of questions because I actually do read the book. Uh, please tell folks how they can find out more about you and also how they can engage with you. I'm not very active on social media, uh, but I'm starting to learn what, what to do with it because yeah, me too. it's a bit awkward know, knowing you know, who's what and why. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, I, so what I've done is I've, I've put papers up on academia.org. So I have papers of interesting subjects that are not in, in my books, uh, such as about Crete, because I go there to see a daughter and uh, suddenly, you know, all these places there are incredible. And I've managed to interpret the, the monuments and two, two not, not monuments, they're artifacts. One of them's a Festos disc, and there's a great description there of what it might have been used for to count and predict when eclipses were coming. Mm -hmm. And there's another one about Saturn's time that I found. And as far as uh, the uh, official story goes, it's, uh, it's just for incense. But it's actually got holes all around the outside. So you could count things and you could stay in touch just from the counting with what's going to be happening in the sky and so forth, or, or for your ceremonies, if you have them. So anyway, uh, where, where do I go with that? Uh, so that's academia.org. And then there's my website again. I'll just reiterate it's sacred dot uh, number sciences dot org. And that's a fulsome site and it's free. So, yeah. um, I, you know, I, sometimes it might get a bit nerdy for people, uh, but I'm, I'm trying to, you know, use it on a broad spectrum uh, as, as recording things. And I found that this book particularly came yeah. out of my, my articles on that site, some of yeah. which are still there. Yeah. And I really love that you did that. Uh, you know, it's fascinating. I just got a question and I'm going to end with this. And thank you for joining me here today. Thank Excellent. you. Uh, those of you that wanted me to point specifically to what, what superhero movie was I thinking about with sacred geometry? Here's my answer. From the DC universe, look at the mother boxes. Look at how absolutely brilliant and cubicle they are. And from the Varvel universe, take a look at the same symbol, the same box, the same sacred geometry, and ask yourself, was it Stanley in both universes and he wasn't supposed to or not? The point is, we are so innately drawn to sacred geometry. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for explaining you this much. in such a genius way. We're wow. gonna take a short break, everybody. We'll be right back.